Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Operation Public Safety Committee meeting. Uh, today is Tuesday, August the 6th. We're going to get started here. I'm going to ask Kim to do a roll call, please. Thank you, Council President. Council President Boyce? Here. Council Member Fincher? Here. Council Member Core? Here. Council Member Larmer? Here. Council Member Michelle? Here. Council Member Thomas? Here. Council Member Troutner? Here. Thank you. Okay, we got uh, five items on our agenda with lots of sub items, so I'm going to ask for approval of the agenda. Mr. Chair, I would ask that the agenda be approved. Second. Motion to second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Let the record show you now it's passed. We're going to move on to business. Item A, approval of the minutes. Mr. Chair, I would uh, move to approve the minutes for August 2nd, 2022. Second. Motion in a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Let the record show you that pass. Moving on to. Mr. Chair. Of the bills. Yes, I would uh, move to authorize payment of the bills. Second. Motion in a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Let the record show unanimous pass. Item number C, consolidation budget, Michelle Ferguson. Good afternoon, Council. I'm Michelle Ferguson, the financial planning manager, and I will be presenting the second quarter of 2022 budget adjustments. So this, there is an overall increase of $16,463,769 with a total of $11,159,990 that has been previously approved and also an increase of $5,303,779 that is pending approval by council. For the majority of this presentation, I'll be using rounded numbers, but as always, the ordinance and exhibits contain the actual exact dollar expenditures. So the increases that have been previously approved by council total $1.1 million, oh, sorry, $11.1 million, and most of those are for grants. So $6.42 million are from PR, PSRC grants. There is a grant for $4.9 million that was approved by council in June of 2021 to fund the project that will widen South 218th Street and 98th Avenue South from 94th Place South to South 216th Street to three lanes. There was also a $1.5 million grant that was approved by council in May of 2020, which will enable the city to design and construct a sidewalk and improvements between Hogan Park and Meeker Street and Russell Road. There was also a $3.226 million grant from the Washington, Depart Washington State Department of Ecology for the Downey Side Channel Restoration Project that was approved by council in January of 2020. A $1.16 million grant from the Washington State Department of Transportation was approved by Council in August of 2021 that has also been added to the budget, and this grant is for the design and construction of rectangular wrapping flashed beacons at four locations. There's also uh, the Puget Sound Regional Council, the PSRC, through the Transportation Alternative Program has awarded the city a nearly $150,000 grant that council approved in May of 2020, and this is for the preliminary engineering of the Meeker Street Multimodal Kent Elementary School project, which will convert the Meeker Street from a five-lane roadway to a two-lane roadway with on-street parking and bicycle path. There was also four smaller public safety grants that the city has accepted that total $104,000. So the remaining adjustments of 5.3 million that council has not approved yet, the details, uh, the highlights are a budget change of 2.35 million for the transfer of funds from the street BNO life cycle fund balance to the 240th Hogan Park sidewalk project and the Wreath Road roundabout project. So there's a budget transfer out of the street fund of $1.175 million and then the budget of the expenditures within the projects of $1.175 million. I have a question here, Michelle. Councilmember Thomas, please. Thank you, Mr. President. So Michelle, on number 1.52 million for a settlement agreement, was that for some, a lawsuit or something that we had to? That was a payout for, for police. Come 
So. Oh, 1.5. Oh, yeah, I should know that number. Never mind. <laughs> so there will be a budget change for that as well in the general fund. And then there is a $1.11 million correction to the 2016 LTGO refunding debt service budget. There was a budgeted line item that was missed during the budget process, but there is a revenue and expenditure that were both missed, so there's no actual addition to the budget. It's just a corrective action. And then there is a $230,000 budget change to transfer the PEG fee projects from an IT capital project into the other capital project fund. So there's no actual money. It's just moving from one fund to another. And then a couple more. So there's $195,000 for the reallocation of the residential street funds. Um, this is to move funds um, into the 2020 contracted overlay projects. And then there's a budget change of 20000 is needed to use B&O sidewalk funds for the Titus Park sidewalk street projects. And then there are two negative budget changes that are needed to reduce the budget. One is related to the liability insurance adjustment, which we do yearly, which total 110000 And then there's also a negative $8,000 to true up the CDBG budgets. Are there any questions? I'm just curious on the one that with the parts for the hundred thousand dollars we keep carrying it over since 2020. Any reason what's behind that? So that one is to kind of offset some of the internal allocations that we charge them during the budget process, just so that um, to use some of those funds. Okay. The twenty thousand. Excuse me, please. Thank you. The 20000 for the sidewalk on Titus, mm -hmm. is that for the moon landing area that they're doing the, on that park? I believe so. Okay. But I can... I drove, by it. I drove by it tonight and it's tore up. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions for Michelle? Seeing none, I'm going to ask for a motion, please. Yes, indeed. Mr. Chair, let's see here. I have that, actually. I move to adopt ordinance number 4439, consolidating budget adjustments made between April 1st, 2022 and June 30th, 2022, reflecting an overall budget increase of $16,463,769. Second. Okay. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Let the record show unanimous pass. Thank you, Michelle, as always. Good job. Let's move on to item D, which is a redesignate remaining opera flats fund allocation for commercial affordability. Mr. Bill Ellis. Thank you, Council President. Hello, Council members. Uh, nice to see you. Um, I'm here to talk about a little bit about the flex fund and then uh, uh, repurposing, giving an update on that, and then repurposing some of those monies within the policy objectives of BIPOC business support partnering with community development financial institutions. I was uh, fortunate enough to be uh, last week in an all-day retreat with uh, several of the community development financial institution uh, directors at the Department of Commerce talking about the landscape of funding for a Flex Fund and Flex Fund 2.0 that's in the works and a lot of other funding. And my key takeaway, uh, to pull the last bit of the presentation first, uh, would be that uh, we should move some of the funding to a more flexible category of commercial affordability, which uh, I've been talking, uh, I've talked about at least once before at a workshop with council. I'll give some example projects for that and uh, run through some of the reasons why. Uh, is the PowerPoint? Oh, not ready yet, sorry. <laughs> uh, I was just gonna run through a few slides on that point. Oh, okay, my, my bad. Well, I'll just go from there. Uh, so the, where we're talking is currently we had 2.75 million in uh, uh, for flex fund contribution and uh, we've spent 1.65 million earmarked for Kent businesses into the flex fund which is several CDFIs in one collaborative uh, fund. We've obligated that amount of money. Uh, currently there is a working Washington grant round five available to all businesses in the state of Washington. There's also uh, the U.S. Treasury put out something called the state SSBCI, which is state small business innovation, uh, uh, sorry, initiative credit. And that will also, thank you, there you go. This will help me go through the acronym. Thank you. Um, see, state small business credits, that's $10 billion from the U.S. Treasury. Uh, which will enable more start states, including our state, to partner with CDFIs for lending. There's also additional monies that the state legislature has put forward 
uh, for disaster relief grants. They're also working on a hospitality focus grant fund of $100 million and a small business credit recovery. So long story short, FlexFund 2.0 uh, will not be needing <laughs> the City of Kent's support, I believe. I think there are other uh, funds of money coming through the American Recovery Act uh, uh, to the state that they are purposing for business relief particularly, and I recommending instead that we look about look at shifting some of the funds that we have remaining, 1.1 million, uh, to projects that help CDFI partnerships specifically on the topic of commercial affordability. Um, the other interesting fund that the state of Washington uh, put a proviso in uh, last year was for something called the Small Business Innovation Fund uh, from the same federal ARPA uh, source. That is making available $34.5 million in the state of Washington. They opened it August 2nd. It's due August, uh, sorry, September 2nd for applications. Minimum re reward uh, award is 500,000. Max is 5 million. 11 and a half million, or roughly a third of the funds, have to be for uh, uh, initiatives in King County. And here's the kicker to which uh, Department of Commerce staff are very, they're as upset as anyone. Uh, they apologize profusely in their uh, FAQs on Friday for this. All monies have to be spent by June of 2023. So that gives uh, an innovation fund uh, maybe six or seven months from procurement to end to innovate up to $5 million all at once, a brand new service line of program and spend all of it, not just obligate, but spend it. Suffice to say that really undercuts the ability to be innovative with that pot of money and it very much uh, uh, undercuts uh, sustainability and a lot of the other things that you'd want to have happen. It even has equity concerns, if you ask me, because who has existing projects on the shelf or what's most likely to be funded out of that. However, our ARPA funds uh, do not have to be obligated until 2024 and not fully spent until 2026. Our federal funds cannot, fund, federal funds cannot commingle or be matched to this state pot because it also has federal money. What we could do, potentially, is look at some of the initiatives that are going to be coming out of that state small business innovation fund and start to create some sustainability for them beyond June, mm -hmm. locally, in our community, run it and train. And so I think one way to get flexible for that opportunity to see who emerges from that uh, procurement would be to uh, acknowledge we've done some good things with the Flex Fund. We have conditioned our contract with the Flex Fund that when uh, there are remaining funds and that final reporting happens that NDC, National Development Council, needs to come back to city staff and create a new plan for redeploying it. So there's good things done with that. But uh, when we put $2.75 million in the mid-biennium budget, the U.S. Treasury had not finalized uh, uh, the rules on how much funding we could give to the NDC at that time. There's only so much that was eligible. So we did the max at $1.65 million. We have this $1 million remaining. Um, so just go back to the state funding list. I think a short list of projects uh, will be around commercial affordability and business acceleration. Um, one of the premier projects of which we already have in our budget, $450,000 to contribute, is Endeavor Northwest, which is a BIPOC business accelerator program being run by Business Impact Northwest on behalf of our ADO, or uh, Accessory Development Organization, or our Regional Economic Development Agency from King County. Uh, I've been talking a lot to uh, that agency. Uh, they've been talking a lot to Kent entities around the Kent Valley Food Entrepreneurship Center. They're looking to play a direct investment role in that project. They are looking to, uh, well, they've already sold their office building in Soto, and they would like to redeploy some of their funds into some area that could be more useful, like helping entrepreneurs afford commercial kitchen space in Kent. Uh, so that's an example of a commercial affordability project that potentially we could be a funder in. Um, we've talked about in the past the high expense of tenanting space, uh, both in Seattle, uh, obviously to a lesser extent in Kent comparatively. Uh, it's like half a million dollars right now in Seattle to tenant a coffee shop. Maybe it's a couple hundred thousand dollars in Kent. That's still a pretty big barrier to forming a business. So one of the things that uh, we're talking to uh, City of Seattle and uh, National Development Council about is maybe a collaborative ask to the Small Business Innovation Fund around uh, a mix of grant and loans for small businesses or uh, uh, I should specify BIPOC businesses or BIPOC developers for pre-development and capital costs. Some of that upfront capital that is hard to come by, reducing the barrier of entry to become an entrepreneur, to become a developer, 
uh, addressing some of those upfront capital costs that are very hard to come by that banks won't lend to. Um, there's some good examples of this nationally of maybe some lending and uh, forgivable grants, $250,000 to $500,000 uh, for businesses. Um, another example, uh, as I talked about earlier, the Food Entrepreneurship Col uh, Collaborative with Business Impact Northwest, Living Well Kent, and uh, Fair Start are looking to make an application. Um, but that short of window, I've been a part of some of those meetings, it's a very short window to spend all that money by June. So if there's something the city could do constructively looking at how that project, you know, uh, uh, stacks up longer term come June and July, having some of this pot of money reserved for uh, commercial affordability projects might help us help that project. Third example, uh, there's a lot of funding for uh, affordable housing dedicated for transit oriented development sites. There are no funding sources dedicated for commercial affordability at TOD sites. So one of the things that we heard very clearly during the community outreach from Sound Transit was support for small scale and emerging businesses. And uh, when you have new construction, it's even more expensive for local entrepreneurs to be able to afford into those spaces. That's often when you end up with big national uh, brand names occupying spaces in neighborhoods uh, and, and creating a feeling or sense of displacement. So my recommendation, given that what's on tap for future direct business lending and grants is quite large, that there is not a sustainable uh, uh, funding source uh, for some of these new innovative programs uh, once they get launched out of the Small Business Innovation Fund that the legislature created, and sort of our local interest in seeing uh, uh, some funding may available for commercial affordability at our TUD centers. Uh, I would recommend that we move 1.1 million uh, from flex fund contribution instead to uh, the related business support area of commercial affordability for BIPOC businesses working with our community development financial institutions. Questions? Councilor McCourt, I'm sorry, I had to put my glasses on here, sorry. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Bill. Uh, my question is, what did we, I guess, what were we thinking of using this funding for before? Before the U.S. Treasury guidelines hit, it was completely to the flex fund under the rules as we thought they might exist for ARPA. So we thought all $2.75 million could be not a grant, which is what we ended up doing to the flex fund, but a loan, and then we could recover 100% of those funds. Instead, what we did is we granted it, but we conditioned and we only granted that so much that was eligible expense for interest rate percentages and for uh, uh, of, of, of reducing the lending that then the flex fund made directly to our businesses. And we conditioned it for Kent businesses only, and we conditioned it in such a way that they would come back to us and form a plan with any remaining funds. So once you did the calculation of what that fund was, 1.65 million was the max, and we left it there. And I had said to you, I think at the time when we were making the flex fund contribution, you had asked the question, Council Member Carr, well, what if we ran out of, out of funding, <laughs> right? And so that was some time ago where even the pandemic restrictions, I think we were facing a surge of Omicron, we weren't quite certain. And we didn't quite know what the final rule was. And so we had, some idea that we would get 100% of it back. Instead, what we've done is we've uh, put a portion of it to flex fund, conditioned them to come and work with us in future with those funding. Um, but that leaves this remainder of 1.1, where we were, weren't sure if we wanted to go back to flex fund. But given all of the new funding sources that commerce is even struggling, frankly, to have enough staff to put out the door, they're quite honest, like, we're having a hard time dispersing the amount of money for the amount of staff that we have. Mm. Uh, uh, and they're about halfway through all the lending on the flex fund already, and they already have plans, I now know <laughs> uh, thoroughly, about flex fund 2.0. They wouldn't want to have flex fund 2.0 at the same time as flex fund 1.0 and confuse businesses, so they're holding off on that, but I just know that that's in the works. I think it's more strategic for us at this point to fund some of these place-based program supports rather than uh, ante and further. I think we've accomplished what we were seeking to accomplish, which was to help more lending for Kent businesses and tie some revolving set of funding to our community uh, on the lending side for capital for us. But there's a whole series of other potential programs that I think uh, would make a different impact with the remainder. Thank you. And then the other part was, I know we talked about having a navigator. 
Yes. So that's launching in September. That's going to be, at, again, at the ADO. Our model has been very influential there. If you recall, we made a small business, uh, small business administration application. There were six applications to uh, the small business administration out of our state. We did one with one Redmond. They all failed. It was oversubscribed. There wasn't enough money for those programs at a federal level. Immediately, the Port of Seattle, City of Seattle, Seattle Chamber said, look what Kenton 1 Redmond did. That has to happen. Uh, the Port of Seattle's put in over $650,000. There's over $300,000 uh, now from the City of Seattle. I've been a part of all the work plan program design committee meetings for the last year. They're going to launch in September and put out an RFQ. We additionally have uh, $450,000 in American Recovery Act to partner to that effort. I don't think we'll need the full amount of that either because we weren't sure of how much economy of scale we were going to get through our partnerships at a regional level. Knowing that that's there, I think we can be at a lower level for that. But I have not made that recommendation yet because that's still in works. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Councilman Malamer. Thank you, Council President. Thank you for the presentation, Bill. Um, question. You'd brought up the issue of the accelerated timeline and equity. Yeah. How is putting the money towards sustaining the programs that get approved through it, addressing the programs that may not have been able to meet? That's a good question. Uh, I think a couple thoughts. I, I'm not right. I'd have to come back to committee, I think, after this maneuver to talk a lot more about specific projects. Uh, I'm just trying to get us to a place that we could talk <laughs> okay. about those types of uh, policy ideas. It's a short time maneuver. I'm not here today to say this is how we would balance that, this project versus this. I, I'd want to weigh that at a committee level uh, uh, in more depth. But um, early thought would be that we, you know, we don't need to give more funding to Business Impact Northwest, but there might be some capacity building for some local nonprofit groups that are in a collaborative that need to have access to those commercial kitchens that we could uh, don't have a ready-made funding source that don't have a building that they just sold. You know, so there's there's those types of conversations still to happen. I think for right now, it's just to pull it out of the very too narrow specific contribution to Flex Fund, pull it up just a step to CDFIs and BIPOC business support, and then come back through the committee process and, and, and form projects more specifically. Thank you. Any more questions for Bill? Good question, guys. Thank you. Okay, if I don't see any more questions. I am going to ask for a motion, please. Mr. Chair, I move to authorize the redesignation of the remaining Flex Fund American Rescue Plan Act allocation in the amount of $1.1 million for commercial affordability projects and work with community development financial institution partners to support black, indigenous, and people of color businesses and developers in Kent. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Let the record show your name is passed. Thank you, Mr. Ellis. Thank you. We'll move on to the next one. I'm going to stick around for one moment longer, I think. I don't have a PowerPoint for this. Oh, okay. But uh, I don't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that earlier. Uh, just quickly for uh, project fees, we had talked about it during the mid-biennium budget. We had put forward $165,000 to uh, help a disproportionately uh, impacted uh, nonprofit in our downtown. Our downtown is a qualified census tract federally for having uh, uh, more community members that were disproportionately impacted by the coronavirus. Project Feast, as a nonprofit that works with refugees and immigrants, also runs a teaching kitchen that was heavily impacted by the coronavirus. It did not receive idle, did not receive PPP, did not receive a lot of the relief programs. Uh, part of the point of the American Recovery Act is to help disproportionately impact the nonprofits like that recover. Uh, what we have today is a contract that is a, more than $100,000. So with our ARPA process, taking that through council uh, for ultimate approval, although we did discuss this earlier in the mid bidding and budget, uh, to help Project Fees hire staff, regain teaching kitchen uh, uh, capability, uh, help the executive director have a uh, kitchen manager and uh, uh, increase the number of refugees they can serve. So that was the other item I had today. <laughs> uh, motion sheet has been agendized for that. Any question for Bill, guys? Oh, we get quite a few. I'm sorry, Councilor Malamar, please. Oh, I'm sorry, my light was on from before, my bad. Okay. Councilor McCor. Thank you, Councilor President. Well, I think, I think it's great that we are doing this grant, but like you said, this is they're going to hire staff and mm -hmm. I mean it's 
not necessary necessarily on us, but are they how are they thinking of sustaining that in the future if we don't have grant funding? They have some plans to create a new line of service around barista training and then part of the contract you will see also has plans for additional fundraising for the executive director. Um, so getting back to you know more than one staff is something that they haven't done. Also, frankly, because of the policy purpose federally that this funding is just sort of right or wrong in some ways and disproportionately impacted, I think there's the, that aspect in terms of how we're looking at this uh, set of funding as a grant, not necessarily a contract. It just so happens to speak to a larger partnership. Uh, I think I, I hope to come back to council in future and talk to our committee in future about maybe a community advisory panel for the food system that we have so many different nonprofits with different uh, lanes and different aspects of what needs to happen, uh, having all of these organizations better capacitated and working together and staffed uh, in some sort of advisory panels and end state. Um, so that's a larger overarching comment, but to this, what's in front of you, I would say uh, it's, it's, it's about the disproportionate impact and recovery that that nonprofit, you know, uh, suffered. Thank you. Okay. Any other question? Okay. I have a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to authorize the mayor to sign an ARPA grant agreement with Project Feast in an amount not to exceed $160,836, subject to final terms acceptable to the Economic and Community Development Director and City Attorney. Second. <clears throat> second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Question. Please. For you. Please. Bill. Hmm? How long has this been in operation? They've been over that corner for quite a while. Seven years. Seven years. Yep. Seven. And this contract would be for two years if I hadn't mentioned that earlier, so it wouldn't be all in one year. <clears throat> I'm having a real queasy feeling in my stomach about this particular motion. Hmm. I don't know if anybody else is, but here we are trying to get somebody off the ground They've been off the ground for seven years, and now we're... This is for expansion of service and the increase yeah. of refugees served. I don't know. Anybody, uh, anybody else feel funny about this? No? I'm okay with it. I mean, mm -hmm. I think we Bill has explained it. I mean, it makes sense, right? It's an expansion, so... And you have to remember we had that period of time in between. Yeah, that's... happened. I understand that. Okay. Hey, any other qu oh, more questions, I'm sorry. Councilman Fincher. I was just going to add that they have been over there and have been going seven years, but in that seven years, like Bill said, it's for expansion, and they've also been the engine for a lot of other businesses, food businesses, to get their start. So, you know, they've had different events that I've attended, and uh, the variety of food and the variety of people that have come out of there and the quality of it. Okay. Quite good. All right. You asked a the question, they're going to lay it low. Yeah, Council Member Core. Thank you, Council President. Council Member Thomas, uh, this funding is for expansion, and we have to remember last couple of years, we had COVID. Yeah. You know, so they kind of need help because they were not mm. able to do their fundraising and they were not able to, you know, move ahead with their goals. I, I with Council Member Fincher, I've attended their events and and been impressed with their cohort of, um, uh, you know, I guess individuals who come out of that from that training, starting their small businesses and getting into catering that they wouldn't normally have been able to. So um, I think it's a great program we need to support. I think they just, um, this one-time grant, uh, it's a one-time grant for now, and I hope they'll work on, not that it's, you know, they'd be able to work on their fundraising and able to, build capacity on working, you know, with county and other organizations, hopefully, so. I'm okay so far, uh, but let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. Is there any accountability? I mean, is somebody overseeing this? Yes, I'll be overseeing their contract. Uh, in the contract, there are several metrics. There's uh, hours, uh, wages for the, for the new kitchen manager. It'll be reimbursable, and uh, uh, they'll be delivering meals to the community. They'll be creating a new barista training program. and. and uh, right. Very good. Organizing new Thank you all, everybody. If you're not convinced yet, Councilor Michaud got another. Oh, thank you, thank you, you know, Councilor Michaud. Well, <laughs> that might not be the case, Councilor President. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually 
kind of agree with Council Member Thomas. I'm just confused because this feels like something that would go through the Human Services Grant. Uh, this was process. something that was uh, in the ARPA budget, in the Economic Development budget that Council passed. It specifically called out for project fees that are at this dollar amount for these reasons and okay. the Economic Development bucket. Okay, so we've already talked about this before. Yes. Okay. All right. Sorry, Council Member Thomas. It's all good. <laughs> I'm not sure, man. Have we called one motion yet? Yeah, okay. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Let the record show unanimous pass. You almost <laughs> threw me off, Council Member. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Bill. Great job. You'll really do a good job explaining things, and uh, we, we appreciate you. So thank you so much. Okay, we're going to move on to item F and G and H and I is around the ordinance that we uh, uh, have had some conversation around. Before we get started, I'm going to ask Madam Mayor to come up to say a few words, please. Thank you, Council President, Council Members. I uh, just want to take a few minutes to sort of set the stage for the next items that we're going, that you all are going to be discussing. Tammy's going to be coming up and presenting, and we have a whole host of experts, including Judge Franz here today, to um, hopefully be able to answer your questions. So the, the background on this, uh, several months ago, Pat and I started having conversations about the fact that, hands down, the most common phone call that we take in the office, most common email we get are from our residents and business owners around crime. I know that you all know that very well because you're receiving a lot of those same emails. And there's been a frustration with our lack of ability to do anything. I spend a lot of my time saying, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do about that. And that's not acceptable. It's not acceptable answer to our residents and it's not acceptable to our businesses. Many of you probably saw the um, piece on the news. I think both Channel 5 and Channel 13 ran it yesterday about KJ's um, mm -hmm. bakery and the property crime that occurred there, the breaking of the windows, and it's not the first time that that's wow. happened to her. Small business trying to make it here in Kent. Um, so through our discussions, uh, Pat and I started talking about what are the most common things that we're hearing and what are the things that are within our ability to make some change for that we can do here in Kent um, to help out some of those issues. And so the, the ordinances that are before you are um, things that have risen to the top in those conversations that we're hearing most frequently um, and some potential solutions or at least tools that we can provide our police department and um, you'll hear in a little bit our, our court with for helping people to um, not commit some of these crimes and also have some accountability, right? We're, we're in a place where what I hear a lot is it doesn't really matter, nothing's going to happen. And as long as we're okay with that, then we're okay with that. But I'm not okay with that, and I don't think that our residents and businesses are either. So put our heads together, um, work with law, our uh, prosecutors, the police department, and came up with this first round of ordinances uh, for your consideration to help us starting to make things better here in the city of Kent for our residents and um, and business owners. So my ask is um, that you ask any questions that you have as we get into the presentation and that you consider these ordinances as a way to really take some initial steps in helping our community be a safer, more welcoming place for both, both of our residents and our business owners. Um, in this current time, because things are things are to be honest, they're they're a little bit crazy, mm -hmm. or a lot. We've got a lot of frustration, and um, there's things that we can do in Kent. There's things that will need to be addressed at the county and the state level. But um, it's hard to say you all should do something if we're not doing something. So that's what these ordinances are. Like I said, it's the first round. We've got a few other things that we're still working on, but um, I'm grateful for your willingness to consider them this afternoon. So. With that, I'll turn it back over to Council President to turn it over to Tammy. Any questions, Madam Mayor, before we let it go? Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank Appreciate you. it. Okay. Tammy White. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Uh, Tammy White, Acting City Attorney. With me tonight is also Michelle Walker, our Chief Prosecutor. She's going to get up later tonight and also talk to you about a priority um, prosecution program that she and the prosecutors are working to put on in the office. And Judge Franz is also here, who I'm going to invite up when I get to the third ordinance to talk to you a little bit more about community court and what that means and what they do there. So if it's okay with you, Council President, I'd like just to maybe go through each ordinance individually, maybe lay some background about sort of what what's precipitated us bringing this ordinance before you, talking about what the ordinance does, and then answering any questions 
um, that I can that you have, and also we'll probably need to tap Michelle for some of those prosecution specific questions as well. So the first ordinance that you're presented with is dealing with the uh, restricting the sale of spray paint. And so this comes up as um, around the nation, cities and individuals spend over $12 billion nationally dealing with the impacts from graffiti. Statistically, um, males between the ages of 12 to 19 are those that are majority, are the majority of individuals who are responsible for that graffiti. And so uh, since 2008, the Kent, Kent Police Department has had over 700 cases involving graffiti. These crimes are often difficult for them to, one, find the offenders and then to charge them. And so out of all of those 700 cases, they've been able to develop probable cause and file charges for 14 of them, seven of which are juveniles. So there's this huge problem where we have these impacts of graffiti, but we are so challenged by our ability to really address it. So in trying to think up um, creative solutions of what we can do to address the problem, one of it was dealing with uh, restrictions on the sale of spray paint. And so the ordinance before you has two provisions associated with it. One is to restrict the sale of spray paint to minors under the age of 18. And so it would require businesses, if they're going to sell spray paint, to verify the age of the individual that they're selling it to. The other piece of the ordinance is to require that the stores put the spray paint in a location where the public can't get access to it on their own. And so that's intended to alleviate some of the shoplifting crimes that can occur where minors could get access to the spray paint. So the ordinance does not prescribe how they have to restrict that access. So they can do them by maybe means that aren't going to be as um, financially impactful to them such as maybe putting them behind the counter or having them back in the storeroom, or if they still want to have them displayed, maybe displaying them in a locked cabinet just so that the, ac the customer can't get access to them without getting the assistance of an employee. Um, we anticipate, if you were to adopt this ordinance, that all businesses would comply. But if for some reason they wouldn't, we're not looking to charge anybody criminally. So what this ordinance would do is charge that penalty as an, a civil infraction, like a ticket. And it would have a sliding scale. So for a first violation, it would be a low level infraction. Um, if a class two, or excuse me, a class three infraction, so the base fine would be about $50. Costs and assessments that are statutorily required usually double that, so the fine would be roughly around $100 total. And then for a second offense, it would then step up to the next class of an infraction, which has a $125 base fine. And then a third and subsequent offense would be a $250 base fine. But again, we're not anticipating that we're going to need to get there with our businesses, that most of them are going to want to comply. Um, they themselves are ones that often suffer from some of the impacts of graffiti to um, their property as well that they're dealing with. And so um, that is the ordinance that's before you, and I am here to answer any questions that I can about it. A couple of questions, Tammy. Uh, just quickly, um, six months, um, I'm assuming that's give the business time to get set up, number one. And then my second question is uh, 18, right? So why not 21? Got to be 20 about alcohol, so how do we come out choosing 18? So six months was one to allow us an opportunity to communicate with our business community and make sure that they're aware of this ordinance and give them time to get in compliance. So whether that's changing some of their business practices to make sure that they're in compliance with the ordinance. So we, we felt like six months was a, a good amount of time that it wouldn't catch them by surprise and they could hopefully respond to it without impacting their businesses too much. Um, and then the age we had contemplated, should it be an older amount, um, should it be or 21 years old like alcohol, um, but we felt 18 was probably an appropriate age for this ordinance. Any reason why we couldn't say 21 as a council? No reason to why you couldn't if you wanted to. Well, I kind of laid it out there for you guys to think about. In the meantime, uh, we'll come back to a uh, council from a trout and then follow by Lama, please. Go ahead. Um, so two questions. Um, I. I actually, I'm really glad to see this coming up. I remember having these discussions in 2019 about this possibility of um, restricting the physical access, knowing that a lot, of, a lot of the cans of spray paint that we see end up on buildings are stolen. Um, so happy to see this coming forward. But I know at the time, the argument was that doing it in Kent would mean nothing if Covington, Auburn, and everyone else around us doesn't enact it as well, that they would just steal it from Des Moines and use it in Kent. So do we have any indicators that other cities around us are considering this? That I don't know if other cities are considering it now. My hope is that other cities will follow suit and that we will sort of be a trendsetter in this area and they'll see hopefully the success that we're having here locally and they'll want to adopt it in their jurisdictions as well. Great, wonderful. Um, okay, and then my second question is the housekeeping provision, um, uh, last paragraph, 
of in our packet page uh, 4F. Am I understanding this that um, if a juvenile is found to be, um, I guess, in the act of damage, damage due to graffiti, the parents could be held responsible. Yeah, so that is a section that currently exists under state law. And so the purpose of putting it into our ordinance is to make the public more aware of that provision that exists. So um, that's a provision of state law that says if a juvenile is caught um, doing graffiti and they've caused damage to the property, that the parents can be responsible up to $5,000 for the costs associated um, with repairing the damage caused. And then there's another statute that also is incorporated in by that reference as well, and that deals with um, criminal gang tagging and graffiti. And so in that instance, you're usually, that one deals specifically with adults. And so with an adult, an adult can also be held uh, liable for the damage associated with that. And the statute specifically calls out uh, $1,000 penalty, plus you can pay some additional penalties as well, as well as reasonable attorney's fees and costs to collect that penalty. Thank you. Council Member Troutman, please. Thank you, Council President. How do we plan to communicate this with our businesses? I have not communicated yet with the communications crew on that, but I assume that we would have some outreach to them, whether it's through um, visits or postcards or some sort of um, social media campaign. Um, but I'm certain that we would make sure that this would not come as a surprise to our businesses, especially as we near that six-month date, if you were to pass this. Any other questions? I guess I'll start with you, Council Michelle. What do you think about 21? Oh, Council President, thanks for that. Um, so up to 18, I mean, you're likely still living with your parents, so if you need spray paint, you can just ask your parents. If you're 21, you may not be living with your parents. Mm -hmm. How are you going to buy spray paint if you need it for something? That's, something that's, to that's good. I, I think about alcohol, right? You know, you can live with your parents or not live with your parents, you still go back, right? I just, that's where I was coming from, so... Just a doll are we having. Uh, we'll just, Councilman McCord, what are your thoughts? Um, you know, I I was thinking about, you know, from maybe arts project perspective, if you're, like Councilman Michelle just mentioned, like if you're under 18, you still have access to, you know, your parents or some other adult who can help you get that. Um, and you're 21, you are probably in college or, you know, on your own and not having access to that. But you could, I guess. It mm. depends. So okay. Uh, okay. I think I'm more comfortable with 18. But I do see your point about, you know, graffiti being done by young adults. Yeah, we see so. about it. Do you have to be 21 to go in the pot store? I believe so. 21 to go into marijuana? Uh, so, I mean... Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, okay, all right. Councilman Lomer, your thoughts? Um, well, as somebody who just bought red spray paint for my daughter last night for a cosplay for Comic-Con... <laughs> um, <laughs> That's why you're wondering about that last paragraph? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> if red spray paint shows up, we're going to have a conversation. Uh, um, I, yeah, I find it hard to believe. I mean, I, I, between it, 18 feels arbitrary if you if you think about this young adult mm -hmm. like to me up to 21 is like a fairly young adult yeah. and I have a hard time thinking that at 18 those that are prone to do it are just going to not be doing it um, so I think I would be in favor of 21 I also think you know it's I had plenty of friends when I was 18 19 years old that were over 21 so I you know okay I would support 21 All right how about Councilman Troutner well, I think this brings up good conversation between my colleagues. I trust that um, when you put this together, it was based on um, some reasoning and um, probably some background research that you did. I don't know if there's any other jurisdictions that you're aware of that have done something similar to this and um, if that's where that age of 18 came from, but I'm comfortable with 18. Why do we choose 18? Are you okay with 18? What's the thought, you guys? Well, my opinion doesn't matter. <laughs> but, I, know, but, I mean, when you're putting uh, it together, no, it, coming up with this, we looked at, like, San Francisco um, was one we relied on coming up with some of the draft language. But also some of the thought behind it was at 18, you can live on your own. You can rent an apartment. There's things you can do as an adult. And so for that reason, that's why one of the reasons why we put forward the age of 18 is it on balance seemed appropriate. But it would absolutely be within council's discretion if you wanted to increase that age to 21, you most certainly could. Yeah, well, I'm 21. I favor 21. What about you, Councilman Thomas? 
Let me ask a question as far as when you, how old do you have to be to buy cigarettes? 18? Yeah, okay. So you're looking at it from a liquor standpoint. I'm looking at it from more like a, when those uh, other Walgreens, they got plastic things all over there, cigarettes and all that stuff. So it kind of reminds me of that kind of a situation. I like what uh, Council Member Core said about the, uh, um, you know, you're at home with your parents. You, you have a little more responsibility. They, they are more responsible. I mean, you're looking at a five thousand dollar fine if something goes wrong. Um, I think that's what I heard. No, five thousand. Where are you getting it from? Fifty one twenty. It was a pad. I thought up to five. Thousand. <laughs> a lot of paint. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So answer your question at eighteen. Okay. And uh, Cosmo Fincher. I'm okay with 18. I'm a crafter. And so I think about going to Joanne's and getting paint out of the case. And, you know, art classes, some of the projects that they come up with the high school, the high school is fine, but what about that college student mm -hmm. who is not again with their parents? So I'm okay with 18. Okay, 18 it is. Good discussion. <laughs> Let's move on. Okay, well, um, there's a, is there a motion for this? I thought ordinance? you wanted to go through all of them. I can do that if you'd like me to. Oh. Are they, they, they tell, kind of, They're separate. Yeah, okay, let's just do the motion then. Okay. 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 Mr. Chair, I move to approve ordinance number 4440 that amends chapter 9.02 of the Kent City Code to make housekeeping revisions to KCC 9.02.060.660 related to the crime of possessing graffiti tools and to enact new code selection sections that restrict public access to aerosol paint containers and prohibit sales of those paint containers to minors. Second. Motion is second. Any discussion? I do have. Please. I had a long discussion with Pat earlier and one other thing that just to throw in there in case it would change anyone's mind on the age. He also mentioned the problem of people huffing and so just remember that that's part of this. People who? Doing what? Huffing. Huffing. What's that? Where you put the, my understanding, you have the bag, you. Oh. Yeah, inhale. The Man, you learn something new every day. <laughs> okay, thank you. Did we pass this already? I'm totally. <laughs> There's a motion and a second. Okay, you had a discussion, that's right. I'm too close to Councilman <laughs> Thomas, he's rubbing off on me here. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Let the record show your name is passed. Sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So the next ordinance before you is one that would prohibit solicitation of occupants of vehicles. And so um, right now throughout the city in different locations, we have individuals who stand in the medians um, who also, when cars are stopped, will walk up and down the lanes. And so they go up to a vehicle in order to solicit different things from the vehicle. Uh, it creates not only a safety issue for themselves, but also the motoring public. Some cars will start going and then stop suddenly because an individual is there asking for something. So it causes a risk of harm to other drivers. Um, you know, if a driver is distracted by a pedestrian that's in their lane, they could swerve and hit some other pedestrian that's walking along the lane. So this is one um, where we did look to other jurisdictions and see how have they dealt with this. And so our neighbor Des Moines, as well as Pierce County, has adopted an ordinance very similar to the one that I'm putting before you tonight. The only difference is our definition of solicit or solicitation follows a, another definition we have elsewhere in our code. That is the only difference, but otherwise it's consistent with what Des Moines has done. Um, so what it does now is we'll prohibit an individual from being in a median or from walking in the lane to solicit something from somebody else. And so if they were to violate that ordinance, it would be a misdemeanor. Uh, it is a situation though where what officers more likely would do would be to talk to an individual and indicate that this behavior or this conduct is not allowed and to move along. It's not one that I would anticipate they would go out in, in broad force to enforce and uh, arrest individuals under. With that, I can answer any questions you may have. Okay, any question? Hey. Oh, Councilor Malarmer? Yeah, so just um, clarif clarifying, I'm trying to understand. So what I see a lot of is uh, freeway off ramps or, you know, and they're standing there oh, yeah. by the side. Like, does that, it's not quite a median, it's not like. 
It would fall within it. So it depends on where it is on the roadway. So if it falls under the definition of an arterial roadway, which we define in um, the ordinance as being a public roadway with a marked or painted yellow center line. So depending upon where they are in the roadway, if it has that. So like a, a neighborhood residential street, I don't believe has most of them a yellow center line running down. The off ramp, I don't believe that either. You yellow, know, so it so. wouldn't get that location. But say um, Willis Street, where there is the yellow line, it would include... Um, anybody who's soliciting along that stretch of the roadway or um, I believe over by it's James and Central I think there's an individual who walks through with signs and they literally go up and down the lanes um, that would be in violation of this ordinance so the critical definition is that arterial roadway which is that yellow center line yellow. okay thank you Councillor McCor thank you council president um Tammy, I think I asked Pat already this, but just clarifying again, you know, like the ice cream vendors who stop, like, you know, just selling ice cream along the road and stopping to, you know, uh, I guess sell it to kids along the side. It might have a yellow line. It might not. So just clarifying that they're not going to be in violation? They would be if they're in a roadway with that marked yellow line. And so those roadways are the ones where there's usually more traffic going back and forth. So if they are on a residential street that doesn't have that, then that would be a location that they could be in. Or if they go into a planned unit development where those streets are just, you know, paved areas that don't have that yellow line, those are locations where um, they could have their ice cream truck. Right now, the only exceptions that are under the ordinance are those who would be summoning aid in an emergency situation, construction workers who are out on the roadway, um, somebody who's flagging down a taxi or a shuttle service. Right now, those are the only ones under the ordinance presented to you that would be exempt from its provisions. Okay, thank you. Councilor Michelle. Thank you, Council President. I just want to clarify that this does not include sidewalks. So yeah. car washes and stuff, they can still stand there and wave their signs as long as they don't enter the roadway. Correct. This is getting to those individuals who step into the roadway and put themselves and other people at risk. Council Member, no one. You took it off. I, I would say that uh, I did get a call from uh, Gwen Allen Carson, and she told me I could speak for her. But this incident happened to her about a week ago up on uh, 256 to 104, and she was driving, and this lady was, so she was collecting money for a baby, had a big picture of the baby, and just ran across the street, and she almost hit the lady and just really just freaked her out, right? And, uh, and I was going home the other day, exact same thing. So, you know, you go 256 to 104, you'll see a lot. I mean, they're just running across the street back and forth. I mean, it's very dangerous, and it's a matter of time for somebody to actually get hurt or get killed, right? So I think this is something that, Definitely need to be looked at from a public safety perspective. So just want to share that. Gwen asked me to share that as well, too. Okay. Ready? All done? Mr. Please. President, I move to approve ordinance number 4441, adding sections 9.02.645 to the Skit City Code that prohibits any person from entering or remaining on an arterial roadway or median with the intent to conduct a solicitation of the occupant of any vehicle traveling on or stopped on the arterial roadway. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing that, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? For well, the record show unanimous pass. Thank you. Tammy. Thank you. So the last ordinance I have for you tonight is one that will make it unlawful to use drugs in public. And so this one, I'm going to give you a little bit more background, some of this stuff you've already heard from other presentations that have been made before the full, full council. But um, what we've observed happening in Kent, and I think sort of consistently in other cities, is that there is drug use happening in open more than it has in past. Um, part of this coincides with changes that have happened to state law that has made it more difficult for law enforcement to do anything about that conduct that's happening. So under the law, it is still um, unlawful to knowingly possess drugs in public. But what the state legislature has done is it's limited uh, law enforcement's ability to arrest any individual for breaking those laws. And so law enforcement's response when an individual is using drugs in public is they have to provide them with a referral to services. And all that means is that an officer has to give them a list of services where they can go to. But under the law, under current law, officers cannot demand or command somebody to identify themselves where they can keep track. So under the law, before an officer can even arrest somebody for knowingly possessing drugs, um, they first have to document that the individual has twice been referred to services. 
but if an individual does not have to give their name or be identified so an officer can keep track of that, it really limits their ability to do anything. So we get calls from citizens upset that individuals are in their business doorways or in the parking lot or in the park doing drugs in open and our law enforcement is significantly curtailed in what they can do to deal with that conduct. So the legislature, I think, was very well intended in what they were looking to do, which is connect individuals with services. But we don't have the ability to require somebody to obtain services until we often have a criminal case ongoing in court where defense counsel can work with the prosecutor to try to get an individual into treatment or post-conviction where the court can actually require the individual as part of their sentence to go into treatment and follow those recommendations of their treatment provider. So right now, under the current law, there's just little motivation for addicts to go and get treatment. Nobody can command or demand that they go and get the treatment that they need. We are limited in our ability to be able to arrest them and force them into the criminal court system. So right now, they can just evade arrest and avoid prosecution by not identifying themselves. And so that is contributing to the continued open use of drugs in public. So uh, once an individual is connected with the court system, we just have more tools that are available kind of in our toolkit. Um, not all drug offenders, though, will be accepting of that treatment. And so with our criminal cases, we deal with that at times where if we try treatment and they fail, then sometimes they do have to spend more time in jail because that is the only other alternative if an individual will not make changes to their conduct. But the goal of everybody involved in the criminal justice system, be it the officers, the prosecutors, defense attorneys, and the court, is to get addicts connected with treatment. But unfortunately, unless we have the threat of jail hanging over them, we can't force them kind of down that path unless they voluntarily want to do it on their own. And unless they have a strong support system, they're not likely to get connected with services on their own. Mm -hmm. And so Judge Franz is here, and I would really like to provide an opportunity where he could talk to you a little bit more about what community court is and kind of how they deal with substance abuse um, offenders through the community court program. Thank you. Mind? And it also maybe you can share what you are seeing as well too, maybe you can share that knowledge with us, please. Sure, and good evening everyone, and thank you for having me here today. Um, we do have some exciting developments happening in our community court program. I'll give you just a little bit of background. The goal of the program is to assist individuals struggling with poverty, mental health, and severe addiction in getting connected to resources that can hopefully address those core issues and put them in a better position um, once they leave the court and hopefully reduce um, the level of reoffense um, that can happen in the future if those core issues are not addressed. Right now our program meets, the, usually it's the second Friday of every month. We're growing fast. Uh, this last Friday we just had our largest calendar. We had 30 participants scheduled. Uh, granted, this is a dealing with this demographic. It's often a high failure to appear rate, but uh, this last week we had about a 50% follow through. Uh, many people connected with uh, chemical dependency evaluators, mental health evaluators. So we have resources that meet with us, some in person, some by Zoom: chemical dependency providers, mental health treatment providers, um, housing specialists, um, job training uh, specialists as well. And uh, they connect with folks and come up with individualized plans that hopefully assist them in uh, addressing these core issues. We recently um, just got um, funding through the uh, administration of courts. So we are now in a position where we can assist individuals that can't afford the evaluations. We can pay for those through the grant funding, hopefully get them connected to services much, much faster than we have in the past. Um, so things are very exciting in, in the program and moving forward. Um, it's, uh, it's, been, it's been going well. So I'm, I'm happy to be here to talk about the program and answer any questions. What, what are your capacity? I mean, I mean, this could grow, I don't know. Yeah. So right now, we're just starting to really build on this. I think in the future, we will have more than one calendar a month. Okay. So we're kind of starting to outgrow the, the original plan of meeting just once a month, and, and we're gonna be able to accommodate uh, more folks as the program grows. And from a staffing perspective, we feel pretty good about staffing? So what we're looking to do now is add a part-time social worker uh, case manager to the program. We've been um, in conversation with the REACH program, and we're trying to develop a partnership with them so that we can do kind of a collateral borrow um, from their program and get starting out about 20 hours a week, have a social worker present um, on the program that can assist individuals directly, and more importantly, that can connect folks with resources off calendar. I mean, a lot of folks are in this demographic, you give them notice to appear on the community court calendar in two weeks, that might as well be two years down the road. 
if we have somebody that can keep close contact with these folks, follow through with them, and get them connected to resources off calendar and outside the court process, I think you're going to see a success rate go up dramatically. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Malamer? Um, I'm curious. You said there's a about a 50% no-show. What happens to that 50% that do not show? Well, sometimes we, sometimes we don't know. Um, sometimes it may go into bench warrant status. We may see them down the road. Um, you know, if you think about this demographic, um, you know, a lot of these folks making it to that uh, to that court appearance is probably a, a, oftentimes a very low priority. They're worried about where they're going to sleep tonight, um, whether or not um, they're going to be dope sick tomorrow. Um, so the the challenge that they face, I think, uh, is what leads to the high um, failure to appear rate. Again, I think if we can get the social worker on board and we can have a greater connection to these folks off calendar, um, then connecting to the resources won't be dependent upon their appearance in court at that point. And I think that's how we can really improve our, uh, our, our success rate. Okay. Councilor McCor. Uh, sorry, Councilor President, my question's been answered. Okay. Thank you, Judge Friends. Uh, Councilor Member Fincher. Is that social worker something you're actively getting, uh, trying to get now, or when would that person, do you anticipate them being employed? Yes, we are. Um, I'm, I'm anticipating having a meeting with the directors from the REACH program sometime this week um, to, to hash that out. I know they are excited uh, to partner with us, um, which I think is at this point is a bit of a novel idea. There's some other community court programs that have part-time social workers, but I haven't heard about any program that's actually partnered up with an agency. So I know the REACH program is very interested in that, and I'm hoping it's something that we can do long-term. Uh, this is similar to, to the question that Councilor McCor uh, Lamer, excuse me, Lamer asked earlier. These are pre some pretty good things that we are talking about tonight. And I'm just, you know, are there, in this particular case, like the city of Auburn, uh, do you know, are they doing some of the same type of stuff here? Um, do you yeah, know? I know the city of Auburn through uh, King County District Court, I think, has multiple um, community court programs. Okay. I think their structure is a bit different than ours. Mm -hmm. Our community court program is centered on the connection to resources. We don't have an opt-in, opt-out procedure. There is no, um, and there's no anticipated resolution to any case. So to be clear, our community court program is not a substitution for accountability. Any type of case at any any uh, any point in the procedure can come into the community court program and be connected to resources. That's the goal. Okay. Sounds awfully good. I mean, so I can step in the right direction. Um, any more questions, Council Member? Okay. I'm going to ask for a motion, please. Yes, okay. Mr. Chair, I move to adopt ordinance number 4442, amending chapter 9.12 of the Kent City Code related to dangerous drugs to prohibit the use of those drugs in public places and to repeal or revise other code sections to ensure consistency with the State Uniform Controlled Substances Act. Second. Motion to second. Any discussion? Could I, yes. Sorry, Council. Please. I just wanted to make sure Council is aware of one other piece that this ordinance did that I wasn't able to go back through. So in addition to making uh, prohibiting use of drugs in public, it also adds a provision that if an individual intentionally drops or throws drugs on the ground, that we can criminally charge that behavior as well. And so this comes from, as I'm mm. sure you're all familiar with, the two-year-old child in Tacoma who became um, deathly ill yep. from eating a fentanyl pill that no, was yeah. left in a public Horrible. park. So our ordinance does include a provision that should that event happen here and law enforcement is able to build a case against an individual to determine who left it or dropped it there intentionally, we would be able to take action in that regard too. Okay. Question? Question, thank you. Um, would that include like paraphernalia and things like this that? This deals only or? with what we consider dangerous drugs, which are those defined under um, the Controlled Substances Act. So it would not get into the paraphernalia. Okay. Because I'm just thinking sometimes in there like remnants of wow. stuff. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're good. Okay. Okay. We have to vote. Yep. Councilor McCoy, you don't have a question, do you? Yeah, cool oh, sorry. question. Sorry. Um, sorry about that. Uh, um, so the new, um, with the drug um, found on the ground, are we charging those as a misdemeanor then or? So under this ordinance, it would be charged as a misdemeanor if we were able to build a case that somebody intentionally dropped or threw it on the ground. So there's, you know, some evidentiary issues that law enforcement would first have to build up before. But yes, it could be charged as a misdemeanor. And then under this ordinance, and then depending upon the particular facts that issue, there are possibly other crimes that could be charged as well. And that would be a district court 
That would be here within our municipal court, yes. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Seeing none. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Let the record show unanimous pass. Thank you, Kim. Tammy, great work from you and your team. Thank you so much. Okay. We're going to move along here. Let's see, we got one more here on item A, Michelle Walker, and this is on the uh, prosecution program. Good afternoon, good evening, Council President Boyce and members of the Council. Um, I appreciate the time tonight. Um, first, by way, I have not had the pleasure of, of meeting all of the Council members, so my name is Michelle Walker. I am the Chief Prosecutor for the City. Um, I have been a prosecutor with the City of Kent for the last 22 years. Um, and uh, moved into this position in May of 2021. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today um, about a new program that the Prosecution Division of the Law Department is um, working on creating. Um, it goes along the lines of uh, some of the ordinances that we've talked about and some of the, bi the bigger package of, of ordinances that we um, have been discussing tonight. This is uh, this program we have labeled the Priority Prosecution Program. Um, if you, you may recall um, a number of years ago, the police department had what they referred to as the High Impact Offender Program. Um, this program is along the same lines, but it is unique to the prosecution of um, impact, the most impactful offenders in Kent. It dictates or provides guidelines for how um, the prosecution uh, division will um, handle those cases, um, provides guidelines on um, recommendations that we will um, likely make, etc. cetera. Um, so I want to go through um, some of the program details with you to give you the highlights of that program. Again, we have not completed um, the uh, draft of, or the, this program yet, but we are hoping to implement it um, in the coming weeks. Um, as we have previously discussed tonight, um, you know, the last three years, um, have been eventful, um, to say the least, with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, in addition to other significant um, events that have occurred in um, communities across the nation, as well as in, in the Kent community, um, you know, communities have been negatively impacted to a certain degree. Um, compounding that is recent le legislation that has uh, taken place that um, in our view, significantly hampers um, law enforcement's ability to uh, investigate certain cases, um, and then also hampers um, our ability to prosecute certain cases. And so um, the end result of that is um, what we have seen as an increase in the crime that the mayor referred to earlier and, and some of the ordinances that we discussed earlier reference. So we have come up with this program as the prosecutor's way of trying to address those bigger issues. Um, the purpose of the program is threefold. Uh, one of the purposes is to hold the most impactful, impactful of offenders accountable for their criminal behavior. Um, it is also to increase and improve upon our communication with crime victims and witnesses to crimes. Um, and it is, uh, the final goal is to reduce the r rate of reoffense by addressing and targeting some of those core issues that Judge Franz referred to, mental health issues, substance abuse issues. Um, so those are the, the primary goals of the program. Um, obviously, before I go into the details of, of some of the aspects of the program, I want to um, acknowledge and recognize that um, we recognize as a prosecutor's office that we can't jail our way out of this issue. Um, and that's certainly not our intention. Um, you know. Oftentimes when people discover I'm a prosecutor, they're like, oh, you put people in jail for a living. <laughs> um, well, sometimes that may be the case. It's not, it's not the entire, the, the goal of, of our job. Um, this is, um, uh, we, you know, we want, we're not trying to jail our way out of our, uh, the problem. We are trying to get at the, some of the core issues when we are able to um, and help people address those core issues, all with the goal of reducing the rate of reoffense. And so that's why we have come up with this program to address what we are going to determine to be the most impactful of offenders. Um, just so you are aware for context, my office has a staff, in addition to myself, has a staff of um, six incredibly skilled prosecutors and three 
um, equally skilled paralegals. And we are, the, the 10 of us in total are the ones who are responsible for the filing and prosecution of all criminal cases in the city of Kent. Um, so with that, obviously, come some limitations because there's only 10 of us. Um, but by way of some information, um, as an example, in July, we received 236 criminal cases referred to us from the police department. So following a police investigation, the officers referred 236 cases to us for review and prosecution. Um, it's important to point out that an individual case can itself have more than one charge. Um, so some cases have one charge, some cases can have five, ten charges. It just depends on the circumstances. And I'm giving you this background just to kind of illustrate how um, what we currently do versus how this program will be a little bit different. Um, as those cases that are referred to us on a monthly basis or actually daily basis, um, you know, we file them and they, can, they begin the process through the criminal justice system. Um, as that process proceeds, cases resolve. People plead guilty, cases go to trial, result in either an acquittal or a conviction, um, and the reality is some of those cases have to be dismissed for, ev for any number of reasons, which can include evidentiary reasons. So ultimately, that number that we initially file gets whittled down to a much smaller number um, of cases that actually get set for a trial. Um, currently, under our current practices, we, that is the point where prosecutors begin the in-depth process of preparing for trial. That is where we make sure we have all of our evidence, where we contact witnesses and victims to um, ensure their cooperation or lack thereof in uh, the prosecution of the case. And additionally, that is when we take on the extremely time intensive um, task of reviewing body worn camera video. Um, and just by way of uh, information, in the month of May, prosecutors reviewed um, 10,540 minutes or 176 hours of body worn camera just for the month of May for those cases that were set to trial. In June, it was 9,251 minutes or 154 hours. And in July, it was 9,448 minutes or 157 hours. And that is just, again, for the cases that are actually set to a trial date. Um, so it's an extremely time intensive um, task that we have to engage in. And those numbers are just the length of the videos themselves. You can probably add at least 25% of additional time that it takes for prosecutors to analyze those videos, determine what, would, what is potentially admissible at trial, um, et cetera. Um, so, Having that background, some of the program details for this program um, are this. We would focus initially at least on what we are referring to as quality of life crimes. Um, some of those crimes that the mayor's office, and I'm sure you all get um, fairly constant complaints about, such as theft, vehicle prowl, criminal trespass, malicious mischief, um, or property damage. Um, we, When we get those cases in, we would in, uh, embark on in a screening process so that we would be limiting the number of cases in this program to the most impactful of offenders. And how we would make that determination is based on the information we have available to us, which would be the nature of the allegations in the case that we get from the police department in combination with a review of the defendant's criminal history. So we, we would look at their criminal history and we're able to determine how many offenses they've had in the last year or the last two years. Um, and the program would set guidelines that um, would set cutoffs of, as to um, how many cases go into the program. But that's the information we would utilize on. So we want to focus on those defendants whose criminal behavior has a higher impact on the Kent community. We would also collaborate with the police department um, in identifying potential defendants for this program. Um, much as was the case with the high impact pro, uh, offender program, um, and it, we could, these cases could include crimes that result um, when a specific geographic area in the city is experiencing a particular influx of crime. Um, some examples recently were is involves the property surrounding the 7-Eleven on um, Washington and Meeker. In the past, it's been property up on the West Hill. 
um, at the shopping center at uh, Kent Des Moines Road and Pacific Highway South. So we would collaborate with the police department as well in trying to identify cases and defendants that would be appropriate for this program. Another uh, part of the program would be, again, as Judge Franz referenced in identifying um, or with regard to the community court program, identifying those defendants who have um, some underlying issues going on that we believe may contribute to their criminal behavior. Again, those are going to be mental health issues generally, um, substance abuse issues. Um, and so our theory is in identifying those issues early on, earlier on in the process that can aid us in not only becoming aware of resources that out there are out there, but also um, collaborating and negotiating with the defense attorney on the case to appropriately deal with the situation. Get the people who have an earnest desire to engage in treatment and change their behavior, give them that opportunity. Um, and then obviously those who don't have that desire or that ability at this point, um, then um, that res may result in a situation where a jail, a lengthier jail sentence would be appropriate as far as my office's recommendations would be concerned. Obviously, oh, part of this, this also goes to the ultimate goal of trying to reduce the rate of reoffense of particular defendants in um, the, the program. Um, and so the way this program would be different than the original trial preparation process I described to you is that we would shift the trial preparation process to much earlier on in the case process. Rather than waiting till the case is set to trial, we would start that process at the time of filing the charges. So we can be, as prosecutors, be better prepared when we go to court to address and identify all of the issues that are present in a case um, and hopefully reach appropriate dispositions on the cases. Uh, the program will also in include bail and sentencing recommendation guidelines that would be um, applicable to the prosecutors. Obviously, um, the court has discretion to make the ultimate decision on this issue, but my office makes recommendations on those issues. Um, again, those recommendations and those, those guidelines would come from the nature of the allegations as well as the individual defendant's criminal history. We feel that these, having these kind of guidelines would provide for um, a certain level of consistency um, that is appropriate so that um, we aren't treating particular defendants differently um, than others. And um, ultimately, because we are dealing with a particular population that we have deemed to be the most impactful of offenders, um, it's very likely that those cases would result, at least from my office's perspective, recommendations for lengthier jail sentence that, sentences than others. But we would always keep the um, option of rehabilitative services available if that becomes appropriate for that particular case. Um, and to tie in with the information that Judge Franz provided about community court, we would like to um, utilize the resources that we have readily available to us um, by way of community court. We have um, been able to secure the um, participation of, of quite a few resource providers in the community. I um, mean, it's grown over the time since we started this, um, which is a really exciting um, you know, experience to deal with, that we have much more access and a live person to connect somebody with, whereas before, all we had was a list of treatment providers and said, here's your options, make some phone calls. Um, so we would like to utilize those resources that we already have available to us. We would work with the police department to um, uh, cut down the time it takes to arrest defendants, these particular defendants, um, when they have outstanding warrants. Um, the idea behind that is to um, prevent or limit the amount of delay that we have in the case. Um, I'm sure it's not a surprise to hear that, that sometimes the wheels of justice move at a very glacial pace. Um, and so we would like to shorten that time period, um, especially for these particular cases. Um, again, we, part of the program is a focus on um, communication with crime victims and witnesses. That is often a complaint that my office hears from those individuals. Um, we do the best that we can. We no longer have a victim witness advocate in my office. So those duties fall to the prosecutors and the paralegals. Um, so we have to um, you know, balance our ability or um, 
to communicate with those individuals sufficiently as well as to prosecute the cases in court. But that is a, an aim of this program is to incorporate contact with those individuals at every phase of a case. Um, we feel it's a very appropriate that crime victims especially um, feel that they are heard in the process um, and that they are aware of what is going on. Um, we acknowledge obviously that um, this program, as in any program, will not solve all the problems. Um, and we are bound by certain limitations. We're obviously bound by internal limitations in my office as far as we, have, we are a staff of 10. Um, but there is also, the reality is that there is also limited community resources that are out there and funding for those resources. Um, but we are hopeful that with this program, we are going to be able to leverage the resources we do have um, in a way that um, we can significantly address the most impactful of offenders in this city. Um, again, this is just a brief overview of the program. We're still finalizing um, some of the program, or the program details, but we are hopeful that we will be able to implement it in the coming weeks. Um, so again, I appreciate the time um, for listening to me. Um, I haven't had an opportunity to present to council since the old days of the, the V-shaped table and the chairs that move back and forth. So I appreciate coming into uh, 2020, um, and I am more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Michelle. Really, really appreciate that presentation. Sounds like a pretty good program. Um, once we kick this off, would there be a way to kind of come back and share how it's working? And Absolutely. It would be nice to hear once you get it going. Yeah, so. we're in the process of kind of finalizing um, in collaboration with all the staff in my office, um, finalizing some of the details, um, um, but yes, I would be happy to come back and let you know about the final product. Thank you. Councilman Lamer, so, followed by CORE. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for this. It's great to hear sort of like the inner workings of your office, and, and thank you for being here. We don't normally get that perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I think what I'm, I'm struggling with a little bit is trying to figure out exactly what does focus on mean when, you know, if In we, relation to communication with well, no, just the, that the, pro the program will focus on these uh, repeat offenders. And what, I, you know, part of, I guess, my question is obviously, like, if you get 236 referrals in a month, mm -hmm. you would normally, I assume, focus on the ones that have the repeat records. So it, is it a matter of this program changing the focus to those? Is, is it you're bumping them up in priority or what? Certainly. I, I think I understand your question. It is, when I say focus, it is that we were going to shift some of our resources internally in our office um, to um, dedicate more time and preparation to these cases, like I said earlier on in the process versus later, um, as well as incorporate um, increased um, communication with witnesses. Um, so it's, we're, and that's part of the idea behind limiting the number of cases that will be part of the program, because we obviously recognize that we can't have every case be part of the program. And so that's why we have um, worked into the program that screening process so that we can narrow as much as we are able um, those defendants that based on the information we have, the statistics that we have, we believe are the most impactful in their continued criminal behavior. Okay, so, so if there's like the 10 out of that group, that they're gonna get the extra yes. attention, the extra staff time, the... Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, and then my other question was, you talked about like, you know, being able to focus and work with the um, police department on, geo, you know, on geo-specific issues, yes. um, area issues. How would you, you know, is it just based on the intelligence that KPD pr provides that yes. and this that's, offender and we, is active in this area? Correct, and we've done that to, on, a, on a fairly informal basis already when the police department has a particular area um, of, that is an issue, um, they generally advise us of that um, and we take it into consideration, consideration as much as we are able to. Um, so this would more be um, utilizing them or in, in uh, collaborating with them to potentially identify um, issues or defendants that we might not otherwise have information about. Um, so kind of, because uh, oftentimes there are community or geographic based issues that are going on before any kind of criminal case will result out of it. Um, so we can use that information when we do get a criminal case in um, and pay particular attention to it. Okay, and then last last question I promise, sure. was around the, um, 
accelerating the the warrants or making that process easier? What, what right currently, today, um, yeah. if a for example, if a defendant fails to appear for a hearing, um, the court issues a warrant. It gets entered into the data, database by the police department, and then it essentially just remains outstanding until police, for whatever reason, have contact with that in individual, discover the warrant, and are able to take them into custody. What I am, uh, what this program um, would do is to um, proactively, when we become aware of warrants being issued we would notify police depart the police officers or the police de uh, department um, and ask them to proactively go out and look for these people versus waiting for some subsequent contact. Okay. Great, thank you. Sure. Hey, good question. Councilor McCord. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for um, great information. Um, uh, Councilmember Larmer asked a few questions, but I um, I just want to kind of get perspective, like we want to focus on repeat offenders and um, certain crimes, um, but we just want to make sure that we're not, I guess the other cases are, you know, just as important that we're oh, not, sure. you know, um, they're not just falling. No, and they're not. And, and this program is really, again, it's more of a shifting of resources. We would still handle all of the other cases that we have. Um, in the appropriate way, we would still, they would not be ignored. Um, so it's, it's more just of a shifting of resources for this identified um, group of cases versus um, anything else. Thank you. And the victim advocate, do we not have a victim advocate? Not. Oh, okay. At one time we did, but I can't remember how many years ago now, but it, it's been a number of years since we have not had that position. Might be something we need yeah. to look into. I think it's highly important to have victim advocates. So um, that's unfortunate to learn that. So, <laughs> hey, I think Tammy want to address them. Well, oh, and I think no, and I think Michelle can probably add on to this too. So, advocates oftentimes are kind of not necessarily fitting within our department and what we do in just straight prosecution. We're not really here to advocate for victims um, and necessarily pursue things just for their benefit. We're here to pursue justice and make sure that, that we prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. But what we do do is connect them with resources. Mm. So even though we don't have an advocate inherently in our office right now, uh, we do work to connect them with resources out in the community. So we don't leave them hanging out on their own, um, even though we just don't have an advocate in our office. But what we are looking to do is what, with our staff, that fits with our prosecution model too, is what can we do to better connect with victims and witnesses and make sure that they feel heard they understand what's happening with their cases. Um, they're not just finding out about it the first time when they get a subpoena for trial. So um, just kind of shifting it a little bit. So even though, yes, we haven't had a, a true victim advocate in our office, we've not, you know, kind of dropped off those services necessarily. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Uh, and just to, I apologize, just to follow up on that a little bit, perhaps it was my choice of words in saying labeling it as a victim advocate. That is um, that position we have had in our office, but it's, Again, it's not necessarily advocating for a victim, but it is a, a contact person within our office. Um, there's obviously a different bet difference between system-based based advocates, which would be a position in our office, versus community-based advocates. Um, and so perhaps it was um, my use of words. We've called it other things. We've called it a victim witness coordinator um, position. It's just essentially a, a co direct contact person within our office um, that is able to provide the information that we do provide as prosecutors and paralegals. So it's, again, we're not not, we're not, not providing the information, it's just being done by prosecutors and paralegals at this point. Thanks, Michelle. Sure. Councilman Fincher. Thank you, great presentation. You answered all the questions I had earlier. Mm -hmm. So I really enjoyed the presentation. I did, one more question did come up though. You had mentioned the services that the people are connected to. So I am, one of those repeat, high impact mm -hmm. offenders, I now need to go and seek services so that I'm not going to be jailed. So do those do I go out to those services or is those services there at the court when I check in or it would, what is it the would be likely a combination because like I said, we would like to be able to utilize um, some of the resource providers that we have currently access with through community court. So those are individuals who come to the court on a regular basis um, so that we can make that 
um, person to person connection. Um, that won't necessarily always be a, an option or an availability just based on the circumstances. So, and again, as a prosecutor, I'm, I'm somewhat limited and I can do, we can help identify resources, um, but ultimately, um, and we can identify them to the court and to the defense attorney and to the, um, the parties of the case. Um, but that's essentially where our um, ability to act um, ends because ultimately it has to be a decision that the defense attorney in combination with his client, his or her client makes about whether or not those are appropriate resources, whether they want to access them. Um, because obviously um, engaging in those kinds of programs are, can be lengthy processes. And so that's an analysis that occurs between the defense attorney and the client. Um, but part of the program is we want to, as prosecutors, be able to identify resources that are out there so we can bring them to the table in, um, to aid our negotiations on a case. Okay, and then I'm part of that 50% who comes and shows up, but I keep falling down. I keep, uh, I'm caught again, mm -hmm. uh, offending. Is something, was there already something put in place so that if I'm caught offending again, then it's null and void? Do I, is there a second chance? What is, what happens? if I don't abide by whatever the agreement was that was set forth? If it's, and I can probably answer some of that question, if the, um, we're talking about post-conviction where somebody is under the conditions of the, a sentence by the court, um, then, um, you know, a defendant always has the right to due process. They have the right to be um, notified of what the violations are. They have a right to respond um, and all of the parties, including the prosecutors, are able to make a recommendation as to a sanction. Um, and that sanction can, can vary depending on the circumstances. It can be um, another chance. It can be the imposition of community service hours. It can be jail time in some circumstances. So each case um, depends on its own circumstances as to what action will um, result. Um, ultimately, what we do deal with those, ultimately we have defendants who are given opportunity after opportunity. Um, and at some point, at least from my office's perspective, um, there has to be a limit to those opportunities. And at, at that point, we have to focus on the safety of the community. And we do that in those circumstances by recommending a jail sanction. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Monsieur, outstanding and present. You had a call, you okay? Yeah. Okay. Actually, I did just have one more question. Um, in the, in, you know, in the case where we're going to go out and pr actually pursue the the warrant um, mm -hmm. offenders. Um, what is our current jail capacity, and do we expect to, ha you know, being more proactive? Is that going to put an impact on our capacity in the jail? It, it potentially can um, have an impact on our jail. We have um, discussion of this particular program has included the police department um, as to that, those potential implications. So I don't know if. The chief wants to address those issues. I'll let him since he's in charge of the jail. <laughs> I was so close. <laughs> um, it's a good question. We have been able to manage the population in our jail pretty well. Um, it was on the high side of things today at about 73, um, which has been higher than usual, but we've been running right around the 50-ish number. So we would have the capacity to deal with this, and because of the importance and the focus of this program, um, we would make sure that we had the ability to incarcerate as needed. So that doesn't change the situation for bail and all of that. Obviously, the Constitution's still there, but we would make it a priority to assign officers to go and locate the person with the warrant and to, to incarcerate them. Okay. And are we, are we at full capacity? Or we're, or we're not still on COVID restrictions in the jail, are we? Correct. Okay. We're open. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. To follow, I apologize. Follow up on that question. Um, it's important to realize that um, just because they're arrested on their warrant doesn't mean they're necessarily going to stay incarcerated for a, a lengthy period of time. It's going, but what it does is shorten the time and get them in front of a judge so we can address whatever issues we need to address on the case. Real quick, what is the capacity, Chief, for the jail? We have a 100-bed jail. Um, the, so we've been up as high as 136, which we don't ever want to get back to. Okay. Um, the main thing impacting capacity, though, to go with that number, uh, Council President, is our mental health inmates take up two, they take up two jail spaces per and require additional supervision. So while we have 100 beds, 
It depends on how many uh, people suffering from mental illness are in our facility, which often is about 50% of who's in there. Okay, yeah. so good question. Yeah. And with staffing, sorry. No, please, please. Uh, staffing, are we staff that we could handle 100? We are, uh, although I don't know that all of our corrections officers would agree with me, but yes, we are. Uh, we have had capacity um, to do that in the past, and we would. Um, currently, I believe we have three openings. We filled, we actually started a new corrections officer today, um, and there may be a budget request to unfreeze a corrections posi position later on. I'll just preview that um, for capacity issues. But yes, we can handle that. Thank you. Okay. Great conversation, public safety. You stole the show tonight. So, uh, Michelle, really appreciate you. Don't wait so long to come back again, okay? I'll try Please. not to. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I know uh, uh, our attorney, Tammy, have a, a quick correction she'd like to make. Yes, because I made a mistake. So, Councilmember Core, I wanted to say on the last ordinance we were reviewing, you had asked a question about an individual who intentionally drops or leaves something in a public place if it included drug paraphernalia. And I said it did not, and I was wrong. So I, I was so focused on illegal drugs that... Oh, it was Troutner. It does. Yeah, so if an individual were to drop and leave their needle or their foil that's tainted with the drugs they were using and we were able to prove that they intentionally dropped and left that, we could prosecute that. So, Councilmember Core, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I wanted to make that clarification for both you as well as the listening public as well. Well, it's nice to know you're not perfect, so no. thank you. <laughs> Pat. Pat. Don't worry about it, Pat. We're still good. Okay. Uh, we got workshop coming up. Uh, Pat, are, are we going to try to plow? Okay. Th um, but, but I've asked them to speed it up, and we're reordering, reordering the agenda. Okay. Yeah, give them 10 minutes each. You guys need five minutes break? Are we okay? I'm okay. We'll take two minute break. Okay, two minutes. Grupo Folkloriki Citalia is youth tradition Mexican dance group from Seattle. They're celebrating their 10th